If you have your Bibles, <laughs> work on timing, okay? Uh, so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. God is so good. And uh, so we've been in this series called Ups and Downs and talking about building joy. Building joy when, when life throws us twists and turns, when we have the, the, these, thing, these crazy things that happen in our, in our lives. Even in the midst of bad things, we can have lots of joy. And, uh, and then even in the good times, being able to just thank God and give glory and give honor and respect where it is due. So thanking, thanking God, building that joy. And we've, we've talked about this, and, and maybe some of you have caught on to the tune by now, but we've whistled this song a few times because we live in a world that seems so negative at times. Sometimes you need to do like what Mel was saying earlier and just smile, right? You just need to smile and, ha- and, and, and work on intentionally building that joy, but even getting a tune stuck in your head, that whole... Right? And I just, oh man, how's that song? What's the name of the song? Don't worry, be happy. And it's just kind of a, you know, do you believe that there can be a spiritual undertone even to that song? I absolutely do. And we're going we're gonna to get into that a little bit today. And we're going to have some fun with that. But um, I, I want to talk with you today about a subject from a perspective that maybe you haven't thought of this way before. And we're going to explore what, um, some different types of people. And, right? Kids are adorable. Um, <laughs> I believe that there's two definite kind of people, and many of us know people who, who define these perceptions and, some are, and, and many of us kind of fall somewhere in the middle, but, but I believe there's two kinds of people. And the first kind of people are the ones that let their environment determine their enthusiasm. Whatever's going on around them is how they feel. Whatever pe- other people are doing around them, it determines how they feel and how they behave themselves. And then there's the other kind of people, and their enthusiasm changes their environment. You know what I'm talking about? You've been around those kind of people, right? And, and, and sometimes a person walks into a room and immediately it's like, oh. You know, they just kind of they lose their energy and life is sucked out of them. And other people walk into a room and it changes the whole room. You've been in, in a situation like that where somebody walked in and it's like, oh, so-and-so is here because everything just changed, right? Party can start now, right? And, and it's amazing the differences the ones that their mood is dictated by their environment, and the other ones who they are the influencers. They shape and they change what's going on around. We lived down in the cities and, and uh, for, for six year, years or so while I was in, in college, and we used to go to the Rosedale Mall. Anybody been to the Rosedale Mall? Okay, several people have been to the Rosedale Mall. And I went there one time, I had to, I had to get something, and walking through the mall, and I actually started hearing this, this singing, kind of talking singing, and I thought, this is kind of weird, and I'm walking down the mall, and this, this gal is just, is she's kind of, she's engaging with people, and she's like, I hope you have a wonderful day, I hope you have a wonderful day, you know, and she's just saying this over and over, hey there guy in the yellow shirt, I hope you have a wonderful day, and people are walking by, and, 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 she, and, and I walk by, and I'm wearing a black shirt, and and she's like, hey there, guy, good looking today, wearing a black shirt, hope you have a wonderful day. And I'm like, this is kind of weird, right? I mean, you'd kind of say like, woohoo, right? And uh, I didn't say that, but if I walk by and I kind of go around to the corner, and she's at one of these island stations, right, where they just kind of sell the snack food and gum and stuff like that. And, and she's standing there, and she's, she's just kind of full of energy and life. And I go around to the next shop, and I kind of peek around the corner, and I'm kind of watching and she just keeps doing this to guys and gals as they're walking by. Hey there, gal, you're looking good today. Nice hair. Hope you have a wonderful day. And some of you would probably just want to slap her. Okay? Okay? But, but hopefully by the end of this message, you'll appreciate her more. Okay? But, so I thought, okay, this is kind of interesting. And so I, that must just be a fluke. She's just doing this today. She's really in a really good mood. 
and I bought what I, I, I needed to buy. And then I came back a couple days later because I actually needed to return what I just bought, uh, which was a bummer. But she was still there, and, and she's still doing this. She's like, hey, man, nice, nice, nice red and black shirt. I hope you have a really wonderful day, right? And, and people are walking by, and I, I'm like, okay, i got to ask what's up with this girl. So I go up to her, and I'm like, uh, hey, can I talk to you for a second? She's like, yeah, we can talk. What's up? And I'm like, no, 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 re- really talking. Can, can you tell me why you're like this? Say, oh, yeah, I can tell you why I'm like, no, no, just can you stop singing for a minute and tell me? And she's like, oh, oh, yeah, I, I, can, I can tell you. I'm like, why do you do this? And her response just blew me away. She's like, people walk through the mall all the time, and they got these serious looks on their face, and they're down, and they're negative, and I just want to be here and bring some joy to this place. I want to lighten the mood. I want to be happy because I know it's contagious and I see smiles on people's faces and I love it. And I was like, man, that is so exciting. And our conversation went, went deeper and I was asking her, it was like, so are you a Christian? She's like, yeah, yeah. And she's like, how do you know? I'm like, uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> and, and I was like, I don't know what they're paying you, but this is, they're, they're obviously not paying you enough. So we'd like to invite you. So I actually want to introduce a new staff. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, we didn't actually do that. But it was really cool to meet this gal. <laughs> I had you there for a second, didn't I? Uh, no. <laughs> it's fun to be around those kind of people for the most part. I know some of you just, it drives you crazy. But there's something about having that enthusiasm, having that joy. And no, and, and ha, in conversation with her, she absolutely loved Jesus. And that is the reason that she decided to do this and to kind of counteract this negativity. And her work wouldn't allow her to share her faith, uh, so she found a way of doing it in a whole other way that engaged people and brought life to them. So it was, it was just absolutely cool and having that enthusiasm. And I want you to begin to see enthusiasm as a spiritual thing, to have a spiritual enthusiasm about you. In fact, if you look at the, at the base of that word, enthusiasm, you get this base of entheos. You get this in God. And, and it literally means, enthusiasm means to be filled with God. And it is the base root of, of, that, of that word, the root of enthusiasm, enthusiastic. Born out of the enthusiasm of God. Filled with that intimacy with Him. That is pouring out. Pouring over. Having the joy that is is coming out of you. In fact, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, but thank God. With an exclamation point. Thank God. He gives us victory over sin and death. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know how long you've been a Christian. But I pray that every time you read that first line. You get excited. I pray that every time you read that first first line. He gives us victory over sin and death. Through Jesus Christ. That's exciting. People. That's worth smiling about and messing up your facial muscles. Okay? I once was dead in sin and now I'm not. I don't have to carry that burden around anymore. That's exciting. And he goes on and says, So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work, what? Enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Even though it might seem like, like, like it's not working right, or, or you're just not getting credit or attention for it, if you're doing it for the Lord, you're doing it for the right reason. Um, <clears throat> but never allow yourself to have been a Christian so long and had so many people come along your path and say, oh, Just calm down and chill out. We should be passionate. We should be excited about our faith. About the love that God has. Because 
we have the most important message. Why do we do what we do? Why do we even bother to gather here? Why do you even come to church? We have the greatest message on this planet. You don't have to carry the weight of sin. You can experience the forgiveness that Jesus offers. And he does offer you hope. And as Christians, we should never get comfortable with just that basic mindset for ourselves. There is a world that is lost that needs to hear this. Our culture is changing and shifting so fast. And yet this is a steadfast truth that, that is being ever rejected. But still, you cannot turn a blind eye to somebody who's in love with Jesus and is living it out. It's hard to, to, to ignore that when a person's on fire for, for their faith. So, um, so it says here, always work enthusiastically for the Lord. We work for the Lord. Who's your boss? The Lord is. We work for the Lord. Whatever you're doing, whether you're making Lund boats, or you're scanning out uh, bags of chips at Walmart, or you're processing fish at, uh, at, at Seafest, whatever you're doing, you're doing it for the Lord. We work for the Lord. And sometimes for our wives. Huh. Mel, Mel has gone to d different conferences at times, and I I'm home with the kids, and as a dad, I don't babysit my kids, I raise them. Just to clarify, Okay. Uh, I, I'm not a babysitter of my children. They are my children. I love them. I will raise them. So anyway, we, when she goes, every once in a while, we like to have some fun. And we like to party a little bit. And we like to eat some junk food. And we kind of make a mess of the house. Uh -huh. A lot of mess of the house. And, and we'll have those moments. In fact, last time, we had this moment about three hours before I knew she was coming uh, home, and she's like, hey, we're leaving now, we're on our way home, like, oh no, the house is a mess, kids, we need to start cleaning this up, like now, like, oh, dad, we've been having so much fun, do we really have to, hey, mom's coming home, oh, okay, we're working for mom, we're working for the mom, right, we're working for mom, we're gonna, we're gonna dust, we're gonna, we're gonna clean things up, we're gonna organize, we're gonna put the dishes away, we're working for the mom now, and I'm not saying that, you know, Mel is, is like lord of the house most of the time, but I'm saying she's, we're, you know, we want, you know, it, we love her so much, and we're working for the mom, and, and, you know, we're actually busting out those candles that are too expensive to actually burn, you know, and you don't actually ever use them, but when mom's coming home, you light them up and make the house smell good, right? And we're just kind of doing these kind of things because we want to, where there's excitement, there's this joy, because we wanted to walk in the house and say, Mmm, this is wonderful. This is nice. Thank you. We want to please mom, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Guys, if you're not raising your hands, your wife should hit you right now, okay? Just saying. <laughs> so we, you know, we, work, we work for the Lord. And whether you're, whether you're building the boats, you're mowing lawns, you're, you're changing diaper after diaper after diaper, after diaper, whatever you're doing, you're, whether you're leading a Bible study or you're, you're running employees at the, at the office and, and, you're, and you're making things work and you're, whatever you're doing, you work for the Lord. And when you begin to have that mindset that I'm not doing this for myself, I'm not doing this for a paycheck, I'm not doing this for even my boss man who maybe I don't like so much, I'm doing this for the Lord because I love him. And I'm excited to be able to serve. And it says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, whatever you do, work at it with how much of your heart? All of your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. I do what I do because I love the Lord. I, as a pastor, I do this because I love you guys, of course. But naturally, I wouldn't want to be a public speaker. I wouldn't want to do some of the things that a pastor does because it stresses me out. But I do it because I love the Lord. And he has set that before me. And I will do it with everything I've got. Until I have no more breath in my lungs. See, enthusiasm is not a product of an environment. Okay? Enthusiasm uh, is not a product of an environment as much as it is a posture of your heart. 
Okay? Where is your heart? What is the position of your heart? And if you see somebody that's walking around always depressed, always life sucked out of them, you see them and you're like, man, I'm, I'm depressed now. <laughs> you know, what is the posture of their heart before the Lord? The face can be a huge indicator of things. The attitude, the how you carry yourself can be a huge indicator. But it's not a product of your environment. It's a, a, it's a posture of your heart. And, and just to prove proof of it, you put somebody as a mall worker selling chips and gum, and she's standing there saying, I hope you have a wonderful day, right? And, and you're like, what's going on with you? Everybody else is, has their life sucked out of them, and you're full of joy. It's a choice. I firmly believe it is a choice that you make in your relationship. It's not something you can manufacture. It's something that you develop and you grow in your relationship. I'm going to challenge everybody right now. Smile. Smile. See? It happened. It, it, okay. <laughs> Prime example. If I locked you up in prison right now, how would you feel? Uh, really? Prison food, right? Or whatever. Uh, that's probably the least of your concerns. Uh, but, <clears throat> like, oh, bummer. But we read Paul, prime example, he's in prison writing most of these things that we read in, in 1 Corinthians. And he's in prison while he's doing that. And he's like, yeah, thank you, God. He said, but thank God with an exclamation point, even while I'm in prison, because even the prison guards know that I'm here and I'm in these chains because of my faith in Jesus. And he has an enthusiasm even while he's in prison. And now he probably didn't have all hundred cable channels and the full gym access. Actually, I don't think they had any of that stuff. He was chained to a wall. Imagine that in our prison system right now and how much that would change things up. Probably wouldn't want to go anymore, would you? Hopefully you don't want to anyway. But that's, a, that's another posture of the heart thing. Born of spiritual intimacy. Your intimacy with God. And if you don't have it, if you don't have a closeness with God, you're like, well, I don't really have either one of those. Well, duh. If you don't have the one, you're not going to be able to grow the other. And, and to, to lay this out as an example a little bit, we're going to take and look at this entheos, this enthusiasm, this being filled with God and this intimacy with God and how that played out in David's life. Am I familiar with David, the little boy David and the king David, right? The guy who took down to Goliath. Okay, many of you are familiar with that story. Well, we're, we're, so we're going to look at that. And I want to show you how David had this entheos, this enthusiasm, this, this connection and intimacy with God, and how he lost it, and how he regained it again. Because some of you here, you've been Christians for a while, and you've lost that joy. You've lost that motivation, that enthusiasm. And we see that happen right here in David's life. And what happened? Where, where did he start out? And I want you to read this through the lens of a spiritual enthusiasm, okay? Like put on your, your spiritual enthusiasm glasses this morning. And if you don't, you can just be goofy like everybody else and just put on the fake ones, okay? Probably never expected a pastor to do that. I actually didn't expect to do that today. <laughs> so a little bit of background. If you turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17, okay? We, a little bit of background is you've got the, the, the Philistine army, and they're standing a, 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 apart from the Israelite army, and they're taunting and they're teasing the Israelites. And they've got this big dude, big dude, okay, that's named Goliath, and he's taunting them, and he's teasing them, and, and, and putting them down, and it was coming down to a battle between two guys. And the Israelites were scared. Anybody familiar with this story? Yep, the Israelites were scared. And then this punk little kid shows up, named David, carrying a sack lunch for his brothers, and he comes up on this scene of these Israelites scared, and this big guy standing out there mocking their God. He's like, I'm not having this. I'm not okay with this. This should not be happening. So that we pick up in 1 Samuel 1, 17. David says to this Philistine, after a conversation with the king and all this stuff, gets permission, he goes out and he addresses this Philistine giant named Goliath. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. 
And he gets a little bold here. He says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down, and I'll cut off your head. Okay? Now picture, little guy, looking at big guy, right? And, and saying this to him, I will cut off your head. This very day I will give the car- carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and wild animals. In fact, we're going to slaughter you, is what he's saying. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Imagine that. Now, does, can some little kid muster up the courage to face a giant like that? You, you, that, that, that's, that doesn't come naturally. That is some boldness there. That is some bravery. That is some enthusiasm, not born of human strength, but of godly strength. Born of, a, uh, of an ingrained and an inlaid confidence built on a lifestyle. And we're going to look at where did David get this enthusiasm from? Where did he get that? How did he manage to have this when the whole army is cowering? And suddenly here comes David with this, 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 this authority and this enthusiasm. We're going to look at three things. And these three things. First of all, he trusted God daily. Next, he walked with God daily. And finally, he worshipped God daily. Okay, he trusted God daily. He was a shepherd, and when a bear or lion would come along, he'd kill the thing, okay, to protect his sheep. So he learned on a day-to-day basis that he needs to stand up to things stronger than himself. So when he sees Goliath, he's like, oh, it's just another bear or lion. I handle these things on a, on a pretty regular basis. Uh, so God, I'm going to trust God with this one too. And he's, he walked with God daily. He's the one who penned the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He, wa- he, he leads me in green pastures. And I encourage you to read the 23rd Psalm. He leads me through these things. It wasn't, his faith was not just a Sunday church kind of thing. It was an everyday thing. And he worshipped God daily. Okay? He, he, he sensed God's presence. In fact, it even says later that he danced. He did his public dance. It was almost embarrassing to people. Because he had this enthusiasm and this joy. You picture him dancing like Napoleon Dynamite. And put on the, right, and just however, however he danced. You know, however he danced, I don't know. <clears throat> Who's seen the show? Yeah, don't admit it. That's okay. <clears throat> and he had this joy. He had this enthusiasm and the confidence of knowing what he needed to do, when he needed to do it. So when he was confronted with this giant, he knew what he needed to do. Kind of like people that serve in the church here in, in multiple different capacities. They have a passion to go beyond themselves and do something greater than themselves. Or when you invite somebody to church and you begin to see the light come on, that they begin to be drawn to the things of God and you begin to get excited about what God is doing in their heart. You know what I'm talking about, church? It's exciting to see God begin to work in somebody. Or when you've, when you've been faithful in giving your tithe and you begin to watch God provide and you're and, and get your finances in order, and you're like, man, God is proving faithful, and you get excited about that as well. And this entheos, this God is working in you and through you and building this enthusiasm by trusting God, walking with God, worshiping God, being filled with God. And the tragedy, though, is that it didn't last forever in David's life. He was, he was charged up and excited when he was younger, But then he grew older and the passion began to die out. Why is that? Why did this this fire begin to cool down? And and I believe that there's two seasons in life. And you can look at at David's life uh, and how he was as a kid and how he was as king. And two very different seasons and and transitions in him. We read in in 1 Samuel 17, 48, as this is when Goliath and David are about to have their encounter. And it says, as Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. There was this charge ahead, enthusiasm, motivation, right? You guys remember, you, you know that in a, in a Christian's walk? Yeah, I'm excited. Let me tell you about my faith. Let me tell you about what God is doing. He, was, he charged out, ran, ran, quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into a shepherd's bag and taking out a stone. He hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. And the stone, the stone sank in. Right? It didn't just like bounce off. It sunk into his skull. You imagine a giant. Now I know some of you guys in here are probably thick-skulled, right? I say that in a nice way. 
Okay, why, w- women don't nudge your husbands like, yeah, he's talking about you, okay? Imagine a giant, though, even thicker is called, and the stone literally sinks into his forehead. And Goliath stumbled and fell face to the ground. There was no hesitation. There was passion. There was drive. And he goes after what God was, had put before him. And he takes him down. Now, you fast forward a little bit. So that was 1 Samuel 17. Now, fast forward to 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're no longer looking at a kid. Now we're looking at a king. Okay? And we read this. Uh, in 2 Samuel 11, 1 and 2, it says, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war. When kings do what? They go off to war. David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. And one evening, David got up from his bed, walked around on the roof of the palace. And while he's around, he's walking around on the palace, he sees this woman on a rooftop taking a shower, naked. Okay? And, and, one, I don't know how many people ask this question, but why was a woman on a rooftop taking a shower naked? Everybody ever wonder that? Anyway, okay, <laughs> so she is, and he sees this. But where was David supposed to be? Off to war, what kings do. Where was he instead? Walking around on the, uh, on, on the, on the portico there, looking around, and he sees this, this woman. He sees, so David sees something that he's not supposed to see, And he thought what he was not supposed to think. And he ended up doing something that he wasn't supposed to do. And he lost something that he was not supposed to lose. And when did it start? When he was somewhere that he was not supposed to be. David was supposed to be somewhere else. And he has this encounter with Bathsheba. And ends up getting her pregnant. Tries to cover it up. Kills her husband in war. Sends him off to die in war. And it was a messed up situation. Would you agree? Pretty messed up. And it, it, it shifted things. But something had already been shifting in him. And why was he even there? And I want to show you the contrast between what was happening. First of all, with enthusiasm, David ran into the battle to serve his God. With enthusiasm, he ran into the battle. He was not afraid. Boldly going, motivated, ch- hard charging, ready to, ready to attack. But then with apathy, David walked on the roof to serve his own comfort. With enthusiasm, David ran into the battle to serve his God. And with apathy, David walked on the roof to serve his comfort. So question, how did a man with, which, who had so much enthusiasm as a kid lose it as a king? Think about that for a second. He was motivated, he was passionate, and it was gone now. And I would argue that he was taking his eyes off of his calling and focusing on his comfort. He was no longer focusing on what he needed to be focusing on. The calling that God had put on his life. The the, the serving, the giving, the doing that God had placed. The being a man of character, integrity, and passion. And instead, he was enjoying the comforts of king. He was enjoying the comforts of king. When, When I went to Haiti, just to illustrate this, this kingdom... Uh, concept and this this being a king and enjoying the luxuries of a king. Who here thinks you have the luxuries of a king? The luxuries of a king. The luxuries of King David at the time. Maybe not a modern day king. Most of us would it would blow us away to realize what we have. Most of what we have is greater than what David would have even had. Maybe you don't have servants waiting on your hand and foot, but if you have a car, if you have more than one meal a day, if you have more than like a couple of pairs of clothes, you are living king-type status and having many of the comforts that a king of their time would have had. And he, he's living in this. And it's so easy to let that stuff absorb you and suck you in and get more concerned about your comforts than the calling that God has on you. So easy. And as Christians in here, I want you to think about that. Which one represents you? Are you enthusiastic, ready to serve God? Or are you focusing on your comforts? Where are you sitting in your own personal walk with God? Now, I'm not saying it's, it's bad to have some nice things. But where's your focus? And are they pulling you away? Because obviously it was pulling David away. You excited about the things that God has or are you apathetic? When it comes to talking about church, hey kids, 
we're going to go to church today. Or is it, oh, you know, kids, we got, our, we, got, we got church going on. We've been really having a busy week. So, you know, maybe we should, maybe we should just stay home this time. We'll just skip this time. We'll go next week. Or is your attitude with your kids, hey, kids, let's go to church. We're going to trust that God's going to speak to us through the message. We're going to have a powerful encounter in worship, and we're excited about what God is doing. Which perspective are you taking? Which, which attribute are you feeding? When it comes to serving, oh, I'm going to bring my kids to church. I'm going to dump them off. Some kid, so, somebody's going to serve, and they're going to take care of my kids for me. Or you have the heart of, man, I get a chance to serve. I get to help somebody else be ministered to in the service by helping watch their kids. Which is your perspective? Are you running into battle? Because, yeah, is it hard to watch kids sometimes? And other people's kids sometimes? Yeah. Of course, we're not talking about your kid. Your kid's an angel. Uh, but other people's kids. What is, if, God, if the Holy Spirit's putting on your heart to serve, you better serve. Last thing you want to be doing is resisting that. God is calling you or you are concerned about your comfort. And many people are like, well, I don't have time for that. I, I'm too busy. I've got teenagers now. My life is a, almost a train wreck. If you have them, you understand that statement, right? Um, what are you doing? Everything, are you doing it for God? Or are you doing it for your own comfort? You, have you slipped into this, this attitude of self-serving role to fill your own comfort? Or are you willing to put it all on the line to serve God? David put it all on the line when he took up that sling and charged after that giant. Because if he missed, that story probably would have been a little bit different. But God was directing that. God was um, aligning that. But how does a, a kid who attacked a giant avoid a battle? And unfortunately, this is the picture of so many people in the church. You, you, you were enthusiastic. You were passionate with your faith. And then something has happened and something's gotten in the way of you being able to be passionate and on fire. And it, it tragically happens so many times. And Jesus even tells us in Revelation chapter 3, he talks to the church of Ephesus. And many of you are familiar with this passage. He says, he says this, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You used to love me, used to be passionate about me, and yet you've forsaken that. Consider how far you've fallen. When you think about how your faith first started, were you excited about the things of God? And have you slipped from that? And he says, what do you do when you realize you're at that point? He says, repent and do the things you did at first. Allow that passion, allow that joy, almost even a reckless enthusiasm. So there was a time when you were enthusiastic, and maybe you're not now. And many people in this room even, maybe, yeah, to a degree, I, I hear what you're saying, Pastor. I know what you're saying. And I'd wonder how many in here would say that you were in this entheos, this enthusiasm, and you've fallen away. But what, 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 need, what should we be doing? Tr trusting God every single day. Walking with God every single day. Worshiping God every single day. And when we do that, we begin to see His goodness. His faithfulness, His provision, His passion for us. See, David was then confronted with that. Just like we read here. David is confronted by the prophet Nathan. Nathan calls him out and he tells him a story about a man who had a sheep. A lamb, right? And then a rich man who had a bunch of them. And the rich man goes and takes the poor man's lamb, kills it to feed some guests. And David gets irate about this, doesn't he? David gets mad. How dare that rich man do that? Nathan looks at him and says, you're that rich man. And you took what wasn't yours and you killed it. You destroyed it for your own comfort and pleasure. And, and David, this is the heart that we need to have. If you've come to that point where you just kind of, your passion isn't there. David gives us this illustration. He ends up writing Psalm 51. And he says, he cried out a prayer of repentance. And he says, create in me a pure heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Isn't that those, those, those four words? Joy of your salvation. 
knowing that you're saved, should stir up so much joy inside of you. So much passion inside of you. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. See, the God, God is worthy of my whole life. And I want that enthusiasm. I want that passion like, hey, nice shirt. Hope you have a wonderful day. Right? Nice orange, bright orange shirt. Whatever, my nice purple shirt and green shirt. Hope you have a wonderful day. I want to be able to have that, but I don't want to muster it up. And I believe that every one of us should have this. Every one of us should have this joy, this passion, this enthusiasm, that when you get in time for a, uh, for a worship service, it's not, oh, okay, got to get through another worship service. But it's like, man, God, you're going to do some great things today. Yeah, I'm going to clap. I'm going to raise my hands. I might look a little crazy to people, but I don't care because I'm in love with my Jesus. And he's done great things in me. So when I go to work, I'm going to serve him with everything I got. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to do my job to the very best of my ability, no matter what's going on around me. Amen? Whatever your work is, because enthusiasm is not a product of your environment. It's a posture of your heart. And if you're like, oh, I don't know if I can do this, Pastor. I don't know if, if this is me, or I'm a Norwegian, Pastor. We don't do that. <laughs> German, whatever, Scandinavian, whatever you are, I don't care. Because we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And it doesn't matter what your nationality is. You can have a joy in your heart that bubbles out. And this is why it's so important to be continually filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe this is Him boiling out of us. Allow the Holy Spirit to transform you every single day. To pulse through you, to cleanse you, to wash over you. And when you fill up over and over with the Holy Spirit, when you allow Him to bathe over you, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, it, you know, He gets all over the place. And He gets all over the people around you. And I believe as Christians, imagine what the church would look like if every person in the church allowed the Holy Spirit to just bathe over us, wash over us, build these fruit of the Holy Spirit where it was just messy all over people around us. Imagine what would happen in the church if we operated this in this entheos, in this enthusiasm. And we allowed our faces to show it. We allowed our walk to show it. We were excited about our faith. No matter the consequences. A matter, imagine what the church could do. Imagine, nothing could stop the work of God. When we stopped worrying about our comforts and we started focusing on our calling that God has for us. Are you following with me this morning, church? Enthusiasm. Filled with God. Being excited for the thing God has in store. And a lot, God, help me with my negativity. Help me with my downer spirit. Help me with my sourpuss face. Strengthen my facial smile muscles. And it's almost weird. I was actually smiling at somebody when we came into church today, and they're like, is something wrong? <laughs> and, he, and this person knows who I'm, that I'm talking about them right now. And it's like, are you up to something? You almost wonder, because it's become so abnormal in our culture now to just walk around with a smile. But as Christians, I believe that that's what, part of what we're called to do, not just to look weird, Okay. You know, I'm going to go to a plastic surgeon and have him like surgically put a smile on my face. That's not what we're talking about. But when you begin to cultivate and you begin to remove the guilt of sin and you allow God to cleanse through you, it begins to bring a joy. And you just want to smile. You just want to smile. And it says here in Colossians 3, we read this before, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord not for human masters. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. Doing His work that He has placed on you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You for Your goodness. 
your amazing, unsurpassed love for us. And Father, I pray right now that every person in this room would begin to sense that right down in their core, this joy that uh, begins to well up. And Father, I pray that you would help us that as we begin to build in this joy, as we begin to operate in everything we do, Lord, that you would strengthen families and you'd bring joy into families. Father, that you'd bring joy into marriage relationships, that you'd bring joy and enthusiasm into parenting relationships. You bring joy and enthusiasm into jobs, into the church, into our encounters with, with people at the gas station. And Father, even if that means we might look a little foolish in the world's eyes, it doesn't matter because our heart is different. Our heart is transformed and made new. And if you're here this morning, I'm, I want to talk to the Christians for a moment. If you're here this morning and you're thinking, you know, I could have a little more enthusiasm. Even if you're like a nine on the scale of ten of enthusiasm. God, I could have more of this. I could have more joy. If you just be honest and lift your hand up this morning and say, Yeah, Pastor, I could use a little more joy. I could use the ability even to show that joy a little bit more. Or a lot bit more. Just be honest. Just hands up all over the room. Just, just lift them up higher. Lift them up both. You know, let's be enthusiastic. Maybe even wave them if you need to. I'm waving mine. Jesus, I pray right now that you would anoint and you would baptize every one of us in this room with the overflowing power of your Holy Spirit. As we raise our hands, Lord, and we are Christians and we know better, we know that we are not to focus on our comforts, but we are to focus on the calling that you have. Father, I pray that you'd begin an overwhelming enthusiasm. Father, that people would see it on our face and people say, what is different about you? And they would recognize, and not just momentary excitement, but even that, that steadfastness, that standing firm and unmovable, nothing will shake me, not even the hard times, because I have a joy inside of me. And Lord, if, if for those that are at a three, I, Lord, I pray that you'd bring them to a six or seven. Father, those of you that are, that are a nine, I pray that you'd go to a 20 <laughs> on a scale of 10. Father, that nothing, we wouldn't put any limitation to God's goodness, and definitely not cultural limitations. Father, restore that joy. Bring us back to our first love. That, that excitement. That excitement for who you are. I want to talk to another group in here, but, but maybe you haven't known the joy that God offers. You've been carrying around the burden of sin and you've never given it over to Jesus. You've never asked him to forgive your sins. And you're sitting here thinking, Pastor, I want to even know this in the first place. I want to know this Jesus you're talking about that can give me this joy and, and, and that I can get excited about life. And if you're here this morning and you would like Jesus to forgive your sins and begin this transforming work in your life, I'd, just, I'd like to ask you, challenge you right now. Would you ask Jesus into your heart today? Would you make a public confession today? Would you raise your hand right now and say, I want to ask Jesus into my heart, into my life, that he can give me that joy. If that's you, thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I see those hands over there. Thank you for being honest. Anybody else say, I need to ask Jesus into my heart to forgive my sins, that I can walk in this joy. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Stand with me this morning. One of the things about this joy, the worst thing that we could ever do with it is to hold it and keep it to ourselves. And if you want to be a killjoy, if you want to kill the joy that God has in you, hold it. We talked about generosity last, last week. And if you think, well, I'm saved. The angels celebrated. They did their dance. Yeah, they did their dance. And now they're waiting for you to take this amazing gift that God gave you and give it to someone else. And I would challenge you this morning because just a couple people raised their hands. And we're going to pray with them. And we're going to talk with them. But 99% of the people in here right now 
you either didn't raise your hand because you're not ready to make that commitment or you already made that commitment. Raise your hand right now if you've asked Jesus into your heart and you've received this amazing gift that he has. Look around. Pick them up high. We're in church. This is the last place you should be embarrassed of. Don't worry. We're, we're a little Pentecostal. We raise our hands all the way up, okay? You've got the gift. The worst thing you could do is hold it and not give it away. That will kill joy. Can you trust God? Can you trust God if you open your mouth that maybe God can use you for something amazing? Can you trust God for that? Can you trust God that something amazing will happen if you open your mouth? I'll ask it one more time because people are beginning to catch on. Can you trust God that if you open your mouth, he can do something amazing? Yes. That's faith. Do you trust God that even right now as you're standing here wondering when pastor can let you put your hand down, that right now he's preparing the heart of somebody that needs to hear what you've been holding on to? He's preparing their heart. The Holy Spirit goes before you and he, he prepares hearts. Don't hold it. And I would equate it to a mom that is holding on to a love. Holding on to it and not sharing it. When there's children that need desperately to be loved. And there's your friends and there's your co-workers and some of you, your spouse or your kids that desperately need to know that they are loved by you and they are loved by us, their Savior. Will you go from this place and share? Will you go from this place and give it away? Good. I hope that didn't sound cheesy, but I'm challenging you today. We have often said, you can put your hands down now, okay? We've often said, this church is two weeks away from being too small for this building. And, and, and Jesus tells, it this, tells us at the end of Matthew 28, to go into all the world, to preach the gospel, to make disciples. Can you do that if you're sitting comfortably behind the boob tube all day long, not engaging with your family or with your faith? No. You turn the thing off. You, you put the phone down. And you share with excitement what God is doing in your life. And right now, if he's not doing anything in your life, question of how often you're getting into his word, how often you're trusting him, and how often you're walking with him daily. You're, you're probably not. Will you try that? Change the music you're listening to and you start listening to stuff that's going to build enthusiasm. Stop, stop hanging out with the people that are sucking life out of you and start hanging out with people that will encourage you and speak life into you. Start speaking life into people. And watch as perpetually this church goes from one pastor, two pastor, five pastor, to 300 pastor, 600 pastor. Where every one of you have a calling on your life to reach a circle of people. Do you believe that this morning? And God is preparing their hearts right now. Don't keep your mouth shut. Don't keep your mouth shut. So I want to send you with that challenge today. Pray for in the next 24 to 48 hours at the most that you will have a divine appointment, a divine opportunity to share and, to, and then to trust God. Okay, God, <laughs> I prayed for this. I'm going to open my mouth and I'm going to watch you do something great. Amen? So I'm going to leave you with that challenge today on Mother's Day. It's very def a, a day that defines the giving of love. Go and do that for the people around you. Father, I bless everybody today as we go from this place. Fill them. Empower them. Overwhelm them with joy and enthusiasm. As we celebrate a, a wonderful day where we celebrate women, moms, we also celebrate life. We pray this now in Jesus' wonderful name. And everyone said... Amen. God bless you. Bless you.